So how do you help them through that? Like, what are the main things that that group is struggling with to get up off the ground? So if you started a practice today, which PMS are you picking? Uh, Welcome to another episode of Dental Marketing Theory. I'm your host, Gary Bird. I'm the founder of SMC National, where we help you create, convert, and close more new patients so you can grow the way you want. And if you really want to grow your dental practices, you're going to want to stay tuned for this episode with Vince, where he comes on and he explains how we can structure our PMSs in a way that will help us get to scale the way we want. We also cover RCM and a couple other hacks that he's experienced in his journey you're not going to want to miss this one. All right, Vince. So why don't you tell me how you got into the dental industry? Yeah. So I uh, had a background in retail sales and, you know, spent 10 years or so on the road and watched some of my family members in healthcare and realized I didn't want to be in cardiology. I didn't want to be in oncology, any of that. And dental kind of seemed like a soft intro. So I was like, ah, you know, I'll try that out. And here I am over a decade later, still in the industry, feeling my way through like everyone else. That's awesome. Yeah. And you know, it's so, it's so fascinating. And I say this all the time on the show, all the dentist and the hygienist are here on purpose. Usually it was a family member that kind of directed them towards dental and they kind of saw the lifestyle. Everybody else is here by accident. <laughs> no one oh, grows yeah. up. I, I always tell people, no one grows up and says, Hey, I want to be a dental marketer when I grow up, or I want to be a dental consultant. So a lot of times like people start as consultants or they start in marketing and then they somehow stumble into dental. It's fascinating. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I jokingly say that all the time. Like if I talk to my 12 year old self and said, you know, you're, you're going to be in dental when you're grown up and you have a professional career, I'm sure he would have just stared me in the face and be like, you're crazy. There, there's yeah. no way I'm going to be dealing with teeth all the time. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's like it's like it's like its own little hidden industry where people are not thinking about it besides the dentist and the hygienist again. And then you bump into it and you're like, wow, this is really cool. And there's a lot of opportunity here. And then you start honing your craft in that area and then you fall in love with it. Right. So that's that's what happened to me and everybody I bring on the show. It's the same. It's the same story. So how how did you so when you made that transition? So you said, OK, I don't want to be in this industry or this industry or this industry. I want to get into dental. How did you get into consulting around dental or did you start somewhere else first? Uh, so like everything you see with doctors, you know, I, I noticed there's no way I'm getting into the private side of healthcare. So I actually entered through Aspen Dental, spent a few years there learning their model, their corporate system, knew I wanted to make a transition to private. And I've pretty much stayed in that small, what I call homegrown DSO space of like the two to 10 practices. I ran two different groups over the course of the last eight years of one as a regional development officer, the other one as a COO. And, you know, the last group I worked with, they reached a point where like, hey, we got the number of practices that we want. Our free cash flow looks wonderful. We, we don't think we're going to grow anywhere from here. And that was a point for me that I realized, well, my career is not done. I'm not done growing. So why not see if I can take this model that I implemented over these last two groups and bring it to market and really see if I can use it in an advisory service. And it's fortunately worked out pretty well. So, Hey, sorry to disrupt the show, but I just have a quick commercial for you. We are going to be hosting four events over the next 12 months, and we're doing a little bit of everything for everybody. We have something around full arch. We have something for those that manage marketing. We have something for those that want to scale their practice at Dykema. And then also we have something next year that's for everybody in your practice to learn business skills and to really maximize the opportunities for you to grow your offices. You're not going to want to miss these. Visit smcnational.com forward slash events. These are going to be the premier events that you're going to want to go to to make sure that you're getting the tactical skills that you need to continue to grow the way that you want. Because at SMC, we're all about growing. So is that kind of your target? Is that like small, like three to five? And I say small, but and everybody has different definitions. People are always say emerging, emerging DSOs. And I'm like, how big is that? Five. And then some people are like a hundred. So, it, yeah. it, so I'm, I'm thinking like you, you, those like one to five locations and their desires to grow. Is that kind of your, your sweet spot? Yeah. And, and a little bit higher than that. I mean, usually like 10 practices is my typical comfort cat. It's not that I can't work with more than that. It's that's the space that I lived in. I've lived their pain points. I've been that avatar. So it's just those ones that I can do it in my sleep. And it's, uh, and you're exactly right. When you say I'm an emerging DSO and you talk to the guy that has seven, he's like, well, I'm going to get to 30. And you ask him about the infrastructure of his group. And he's like, 
well, yeah, no, we still are doing billing at the office level. We're still making all the phone calls from the office level. Those pain points that I know they're going to run into, that's what I love helping with. Got it. Because the pain points from one to five are unique. And then from mm-hmm. five to like 10, are it starts to change a little bit, right? Yep. Yep. And that's exactly right. Where, you know, they have to figure out it's an aggressive amalgamation. So is it, am I going to build an infrastructure currently? Does it make more sense for me to outsource? And then walking them through those steps. And one of the biggest things that I always see the back and forth on is the C-suite, right? Of when do I need a CFO? When do I need a COO? When, when can I actually stop being the owner slash practicing dentist slash HR everything? So yeah. yeah, that is, you are absolutely right. That one to five and five to 10 are two completely different worlds. Yeah. And so I would love to talk through that because that's kind of our audience, right? That the most of the people that are listening right now to this show are going to have somewhere between one and 10 practices and they're trying mm-hmm. to go be, and, and everybody kind of has that aspiration to go to like 30, 50, a hundred, whatever it may be, whatever their target is. So how do you help them through that? Like, what are the main things that that group is struggling with to get up off the ground? Well, cash flow is always the number one that I find first and foremost. And it's one of the hottest topics in the market right now is revenue cycle management. Yeah. And surprisingly, when you ask an owner of four or five practices, you know, what does your revenue cycle management system look like? They don't have an answer. So that's the number one pain point that I find most of the time coupled with insurance relationships. Hmm. So you and I both know, and I'm an avid chat GPT user with that's for a different podcast, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> But you and I both know that AI is not at the point right now that you really can have an automated system that there still is a high human touch in what we do. Yeah. So I typically have to start at the boots on the ground level of clean data entry, their insurance framework. So what is like, what are your carrier systems? What are your fee schedules? Oh, I was going to ask you, is it the reason that um, AI is not ready for this? Is it because, is it because of the way it's so complicated? Because you have a, a, a patient and they they might pay some in insurance, some in cash and some on a payment plan, right? Just mm-hmm. manage just one person. If you're just managing that, that's complicated. Plus the insurance companies make it complicated on purpose. I don't know if you've ever watched Incredibles before where oh, the yeah, okay, yeah. So where the dad is at work and the little old lady calls in and goes, oh, my house burned down. I need, you know, my car, whatever. And he's just like, sorry, ma'am, you have to fill out form, da, 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 da. And she's like, I don't know how to do that. And he's like, look, yep. just go over here, go to there, do this, do this, do this. And then you'll get the, and he gets in trouble because he made it easier for her to make a claim. That's, is that is that why it's so complicated and AI can't really get its arms around it? Well, yeah. So, you know, to the point of dental insurance is if you're just purely talking about the benefit portals of each individual carrier, they all function differently and all of them disseminate different information. You know, MetLife is a perfect example where, you know, like an employer can offer a policy, but they may have five different selections of what their employee can make of what that coverage is going to look like. Well, those subgroup numbers aren't listed on most of the carrier benefit portals. So you might get the 18050 coverage, but all of that causation that's built into those policies is nowhere to be found with really anywhere in the virtual world. So that is, unless the insurance companies come to the point that you have full access to all of the causation and all of the subnetwork group, I, I don't see a point in the next, you know, at least five years that AI can fully integrate itself, not only to that side, but then have all that information get confidently disseminated into the PMS. And then back out again, right? Yeah. 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 So the PMS is, they, they don't even want to play that game. That's a whole separate conversation. Yeah. And then I know one of the other things that you help with is like uh, practice management software, uh, software infrastructure to make sure yeah. that it's set up prop. How does that work? Like, what are you doing there? I, you're the first person that I've heard come out and like, I know people do it, but you're the first person I've talked to that says, this is what I do to help them. So how, do, how does that kind of look and feel? 
Yeah. So always starts with insurance. So that makes up usually 50 ish percent of anyone's revenue when they're a PPO practice, if not more. So I dive into that first, make sure that their carriers, their payers, all of that is correct. That if they're using lease networks, that all of the correct fee schedules are attached to all of the correct providers. And then you get to that point of once those data entry pieces for revenue cycle management are in place, you start looking at some of the more policy level stuff with downgrades, and then you can start diving into reporting. So seeing what are your recare calls look like? What does your accounts receivable look like? What does your overdue insurance blend look like? And it's just finding other attachable pieces like NEA software to have a traceable thing for all the images for every claim, mm. building those pieces into their software. So to what you guys do, Gary, like, you know, 35, 36% of phone calls are missed. Well, I'm a firm believer that if you have clean data entry, you have a clean AR process on the front end before the patient gets in the chair, you then minimize the number of report work. And you and I both know the majority of phone calls, unfortunately, aren't marketing. Most of the time it's answering billing questions and somewhat clinical questions. So if you can minimize those phone calls, then it maximizes the number of calls that are getting answered to get that new patient push into the office. Yeah, I love that. And so, okay, I'm going to ask you a question. And if you want to dodge it, I, I understand. So if you started a practice today, or let's say you have five, five locations, and let's say yeah. those five locations, you've acquired all of them, they all have different practice management softwares, but you realize to go to 10, you got to you got to centralize that, right? Yep. Which PMS are you picking? Oh, um, you can sidestep it. It'd be a lot of people sidestep it. Some people answer it. No, I, I think there's a different, and you're uh, one of your counterparts. I mean, Tanner Applegate is a great resource for this, but I truly believe that going cloud-based number one is the best move. And then it's just okay. a matter of, you know, what pieces do you want to integrate? I mean, CareStack's small, but it's very functional. Dentrix yep. Ascend is, I mean, the Henry Schein is the gorilla in the room. Their overall user capability is good, but the actual platform Integration. itself, yeah, yes, is that's the challenge with it. I, but, I cringe anytime someone says, oh, we're with Dentrix Ascend because they literally, you can't play with them. They don't want to play ball with anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, look at their, look at their suite over the last two years though. They'll play ball with you, but it's after they acquire you. Yeah, <laughs> of course. But, but there's no, there's nobody does everything well. So this whole idea no. of like, oh, we're going to put everything into one box and we're just going to be amazing at everything that you need. I would rather have five or six expert companies integrating together and, and doing it that way. Do, do you agree with that? Or do you see it differently? I agree with that, but it just comes down to the cost control aspect to me that when you're looking at all the separate APIs, you just have to have a feasible P&L built out where that makes sense. And what I found is at the office level, the people who are handling it and even the internalized system, you then have people usually functioning out of six or seven on average softwares to run the practice. So as long as you build your infrastructure that way and know that's the route that you're going, which that, you know, back to Tanner, like something like Unify can make yep. that possible. Or one I came across recently, I don't know if you've checked it out, is Shift has been wonderful for me. So what do they do? What do they do? So it is literally just a platform that it has a browser built into it. You download a software and then you've got a clickable widget down a sidebar where you can switch between Messenger, Facebook, Trello, basically anything that you use to run your business all in just basic one software. So it's a software for all of your softwares. That That's really sense? cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I totally get that. That's really, really cool. All right, I want to I want to change gears on you a little bit. So yeah, we are. Um, I was talking with somebody, and they said this. They said, "Look, Gary, all these DSOs, smaller ones, right? So mm -hmm. under under fifty, they're all centralizing too fast." So the thing is, is like everybody wants to centralize, right? So, which makes sense. Let's centralize, mm -hmm. centralize, centralize. And I know there's certain things that you have to centralize early on, but they were using examples like call centers or, or other things that are labor intensive, where you're going to have to hire a lot of bodies to fulfill that centralization 
rather than letting that, that cost be spread across all of your practices. And he said, for a long time in the dental industry, everybody's just like centralized as fast as you can, but it actually, if you do it too soon, it eat, eats up all your EBITDA and you're just in a really bad spot for a long time. And if your goal is to like go to like 500 practices, then it makes sense to start centralizing earlier on. But if your goal is to get to like 50, it might not make sense to centralize all of your billing and all of your, your call center because of the labor side of it. It just doesn't make economic sense for a long time. And it's, yes. it's going to take you a while to pay that off. What are your thoughts on that? Because I've heard both sides of the story, right? There's also an argument on the other side. What are, what are your thoughts? I have found, at least in the space that I play in, 15 million is about the point in which I say, start having the discussion of my, and usually it's the things of like bookkeeping, human resources, and RCM are like the main three that I say, it might not have to be every aspect of it, but those are the first three things that I would start to visit. But typically when you're below that threshold of 15 mil, I've at least found that outsourcing is more beneficial. Good, perfect example is let's talk about insurance, right? So with insurance, you only have so much revenue capacity per person that you hire. So to the point of EBITDA, you're going to have to front end hire and then also fight attrition in the current market that we have in these crazy wage rates to stay ahead of your growth track. So you're going to be running a tighter margin within that time frame. So to me, when you're in that smaller, and that's where it gets skewed, you know, like some people are gonna have 10 practices, but they're only running 7 million in revenue because they're a bunch of tiny practices. Mm -hmm. That's more the reality of it. It's like, you have to look at your top line scale and make that decision, not necessarily on the number of practices. So mm. at least my point, again, everyone's opinion is everyone's opinion, yeah, yeah. but. yeah. <laughs> that's what I found is about 15 million is when I start having that discussion of like, there are some things you can bring in house you really could, you know, start looking at maybe a CFO or, you know, having a strong team with control or handling your accounting, it's more of those functionalities, but call center, all of that. No, I would be in agreement with that. Of, there are some really great companies that have affordable rates to be able to provide that service for you. When, when would you bring that in house? Like if just pretend you have a DSO and you you had to make that decision. I know it's, it's different for every size and all that kind of stuff, but from a location or a revenue standpoint that you would start thinking about that. If I'm crossing multiple state lines and I have, you know, 20 play, if I'm like over 50 and I'm grossing over a million per, and I'm crossing multiple states in that type of a scenario, it more so makes sense because yeah. it's, it's easier to control at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also the, the, the scale is going to be there to, from a cost standpoint, that it makes more sense from a labor standpoint. That, that makes yep. sense. Awesome. So what are, what else right now that you see people doing that are just absolutely winning? What, what are they doing in their practices? That's just causing them to knock it out of the park. Honestly, it's more the soft skills right now. I, you know, a lot of it there, people don't put enough emphasis on creating a good culture in their practice to retain their team members. There's been a lot of groups that I've worked with where, you know, we get a ton of traction, a ton of movement, and then you lose a key doctor or you lose three or four people at once. And then you got to hit pause on everything because now you're cycling back to, well, I have to hire to fill the roles. And then we have to recoach the roles to get back to where we were at to move forward. And it's just that, that toxicity, unfortunately, that if, you can't build a place where people want to stay in this day and, day and age. And it's not all about wages. It's more so about, you know, like using, you know, like a promoter score system to make sure that you hear them and you're actually listening and addressing what they feel needs to be changed. People that are doing that are crushing it. Anyone that can put a net promoter score out there that says like, hey, my group is the place to come and work. They're the ones that are thriving. Yeah, that's so true. So, so and it's interesting because for a while there, we heard nothing but culture, 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 culture. Then the market shifted. And actually, I was on a podcast with Tanner and I predicted this. I said, we're not going to talk about, people are going to stop talking about culture when it becomes an employer market, right? So when it's mm -hmm. an employee market, everybody talks about culture. When it's an employer oh, yeah. market, it's like, we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> like they're lucky to have a job with us, right? And so we've seen that pendulum swing where it was all culture, culture, culture. Now we're kind of 
back on the no conversations around culture anymore. Have you kind of noticed that as well? A little bit, yeah. I mean, it's definitely gotten out of COVID times and the stuff we dealt with over the last few years. But I mean, let's be honest, let's look at where we're going from an economic perspective in the U.S. Mm. People are going to want to stay at a place where they enjoy to work. I firmly believe that culture is always going to be part of the conversation. And to that point of, you know, this is when people, when they do the things well that no one's talking about, those are the ones that are going to break through and thrive during hard times. So what, so how, what are the things, what are the key elements that you're seeing with people from a practical standpoint on the culture side? Because a lot of times, I'll be honest, for me, I thought culture was just something people talked about to sell books. And I thought it was just this fluffy <laughs> thing. And then as I as I grew a business and I started to learn and started to have turnover and, and dealing with problems, I was like, oh, this is what they meant. Like, it's not possible mm-hmm. to grow unless you have some kind of culture that you're... Con- that you're, 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 you're building into, right? So what are some yeah. practical things that people could do from your perspective to make culture work for their, their group, especially at that, like five to 10 as they're growing. And I'll add this caveat on the one thing that I have noticed is that you have DSOs that talk about, we have amazing culture and they might have an amazing culture at the DSO at the, you know, the corporate office, but then it's a dumpster fire at the office level because awesome. those are two two totally different things, two totally different cultures. And that's really hard to manage. What are your thoughts on that? What are some practical things that people can do? So the things that I say is clarity and cadence of communication. So if you have clarity around your business and where it's going and you have everyone, you know, everyone says rowing in the same direction, but half the time you're right as half the people that need paddles don't even have a paddle to row. So Having that clarity around this is what the company is going to be doing. These are our current challenges. This is what we're working on. And then that cadence of communication of having just regular check-ins with people at exactly that. It has to be a bottom-up perspective of your office-level office managers as part of their job responsibility should have at least a monthly touch with their team members. Because let's be honest, it's not like dental practices are you know, 50, 70, 150 employees at the office. It's five or six people. So to block out six hours of your month to talk with the team and make sure everyone's on the same page, I can go miles. So that exactly that bottom up communication is one of the biggest things I've seen. I totally agree. And that that's huge. Um, And that's what it's hard to do, right? It's easy to talk about alignment is another thing to actually pull off and and make (laughs) happen. Um, that's awesome. Is there any other words of wisdom that you would have? Anything else that you've learned along the way that you go, you know what, this is something that you really need to think about if you're really going to grow the way you want over the next three to five years. I think it's exactly that. It's what do you want? You know, like everyone has a BHAG, but the first thing you need to do is really sit down, introspection time, and decide, do I want 10? Do I want 30? What does that look like for balance for me? Can I provide the type of company that's going to be a place that can grow to that? That's, that's where you have to start. You have to really be clear in what you want. And then that's, that's gotta be your mission. And that's where you gotta drive towards. A lot of these guys that say seven to 30, they get stuck at seven because they just say the number 30 and they don't know how to get there, nor do they put a plan in place. It just sounds nice and. You know, the word EBITDA gets thrown around a lot. That's like the bigger I get, the better multiple I get. And I can just sell off and then I can ride off into the sunset, but it seldom happens. So clarity around what you want is the biggest thing and find out if it's a balance. And if you're going to have that of like, I want 10, but I want family time, then you need to hire like-minded people that have that same type of vision to fit where you want to go. Yeah. I think that's kind of the secret to a lot of things in life is if you don't know what you want, how are you going to get it? <laughs> and and so you yeah. end up kind of getting things that unintended consequences. So you got to know yeah. what you want. And uh, yeah, if you just say, well, I just want to be the biggest DSO in the world, or I just want to be the most profitable or whatever, there's unintended consequences that come along with that. Um, so anyways, I, I totally agree with you on that. That's spot on great answer. And then, um, if someone wants to reach out to you and learn more about what you're doing, how, how can they reach you? Yeah. So website is midline dental partners.com. All of our information is there. Uh, one of the newest services that we've launched is we're actually helping first time buyers, startups, 
Docs, exactly like we're talking about, small groups with RCM implementation and handling all of the PPO optimization. So negotiations and integration of that as well. That's awesome, man. Thanks so much for coming on. You did a great job. Yeah, thanks, Gary.